Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I am happy to have Gregory Wrightstone here today to talk about climate change and maybe his uh, book, Inconvenient Facts. I have that book on Audible and on Kindle, and it's fantastic, just packed with good, good stuff. So uh, do you want to go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself to kick things off here? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a geologist, and uh, I've been studying Earth's processes for more than 30 years, a lot more than 30 years. Uh, but uh, I got interested in climate change. I knew that some of what we were being told about climate change was incorrect. I suspected other things as a geologist were wrong. And the book, Inconvenient Facts, the re was the result of my personal search for the truth about climate change. And so as I started going into it, I, I said, you know what? I'm not going to trust anybody. I'm going to go back and look at the base data. I'm going to look at the data itself, make my own decisions and I don't want to be influenced and frankly what I found angered me I found that just about all of these subjects we're being told about these pending or looming or actually catastrophes that are ongoing just the opposite I found just the opposite and it was it was a revelation and so uh, the book itself I it was published five years ago and, and Tom, it's amazing. We were back at a number one bestseller on Amazon as recently as last week. We, we, we stayed at number one bestseller for Amazon on Amazon in at least one category for 10 days, in, which is, that should not happen with books. And it, that's just a testament. Um, I don't know, somebody took over my body and my mind when I started writing this because people just love it. Uh, it's my day. I'm working on my second book now. Uh, the first book dealt with the 60, what I call the inconvenient facts that fly in the face of this notion of catastrophic warming. This next book uh, deals on the many benefits. It's in three sections, many benefits that we see accruing to ecosystems and humanity from the combination of modest warming and increased CO2. And it's it's a big, big, really good story that needs told. By almost every metric we look at, Earth's ecosystems are thriving and prospering and the human conditions improving because of modest warming and increased CO2. We should celebrate that, not demonize it. And it's, again, people like me are silenced when we try and tell this story. I was just recently permanently banned from LinkedIn after posting factual data concerning the long-term history of carbon dioxide. I posted a chart of 600 million years of CO2 data showing that CO2 data today is at historically low levels. Uh, it's one-sixth of what the average was throughout Earth's history. Uh, so looking at this long-term data, uh, we're CO2 impoverished. We don't have too much CO2. We don't have enough. And right. LinkedIn, without any warning, said you're permanently banned. They banned me last year. Now, now Tom, you'll find this is funny. This is, you got to laugh. So they banned me in October of last year, my very last post. And again, I'm a scientist. I post factual scientific data. And my very last post, I said, I think I'm about to be banned and deplatformed by LinkedIn. They removed it, called it false and misleading, and then banned and deplatformed me. <laughs> now, now that's funny. I don't care who you are. That's funny. And you can't make yeah. this stuff up. But they did it. And, um, you know, so we're trying to get our, our word out, trying to go around. We're on social media. Uh, we just put up a, uh, a billboard on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. 40,000 cars go by it every day. There's a woman resting comfortably in her bed. It says, sleep well, there is no climate crisis. And, you know, people are driving by and heads are exploding as they see this. So we want to try and get the word out um, about this, the benefits we see of, of more CO2. And again, the modest warming, Tom, it's, it's warmed eight tenths of a degree since 1900. Well, that's not too alarming to me. We see higher temperature increases between a noon and 2 p.m. every day. Uh, if you don't like it a degree warmer, well, just move 150 miles north, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you'll be okay. You won't, it won't be so dangerous. You'll, you'll, 
you can cut that uh, one degree temperature down or move to just a slightly higher elevation. Uh, and you won't have to worry about that. Yeah, I just think it's amazing that they would ban you on social media just for uh, producing facts. But I think it's so great that uh, on Amazon, I guess they're still selling your book. And I just looked out there. I think you have 1800 reviews. It's a solid five star review. So people are, are reading the book that it's a bestseller. It just makes me ecstatic. I love it. Yeah. And as a scientist, people, the biggest review of my book, anti that, that hate me, uh, this, it was a light, it did a great job. It was I, 25 pages uh, going through my book, trying, and his summary says, well, uh, Wrightstone presents 60 facts that are actually correct, uh, but his interp he, he gets the interpretation wrong. So he, he admitted in this review that I get it right, but I don't get, I don't, I'm not interpreting the data correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, and it's just, it's stuff like that. So, so nobody's been able to really dispute anything in my book. I, I again, I'm, I'm very serious about the science. Uh, and as here at the CO2 coalition, we've got about 110 of the top scientists and engineers and experts in the world working on, I believe as I do, working on climate change and trying to get the facts out. It's it's really an honor to lead such a distinguished group, and it's uh, we have people like uh, Dr. Will Happer, who's emeritus professor at Princeton, uh, Dr. Richard Lins, an emeritus professor at MIT. These are two of the top physicists of our time. They're legends that walk among us, and we should we should treasure them. Uh, I had a funny conversation with with our chair Will Happer last weekend. Uh, we were talking about a gentleman that was at a top environmental group that said that he he read my book and he came and met with me and he, he wants to walk away from this climate change agenda that he's been pushing for years. And Will says, you know, I'm reading uh, uh, Dante's Inferno and there's I found out that uh, there's a special place in hell for people who know that evil is going on and they stay silent. Oh, and by the way, I'm reading it in Russian to improve my Russian. Now, who does that? Wow. <laughs> you know, that I was like, really? That's our leader, Will Happer. He, he's, he's an amazing man. Uh, he's completing a, working feverishly now on a paper on nitrogen, nitrous oxide. There's, that's the new demon molecule. They've been demonizing carbon dioxide now for uh, 30 to 40 years, the new demon molecule is N2O. And that's the basis for fertilizer, nitrogen-based fertilizer, which is a key component for growing crops throughout the world. And now they want to get rid of it. And they're really, they're, you, if you go, you can't find information debunking this. This paper will be the landmark paper. It deals first with the physics of greenhouse gas in other words, how much greenhouse, it is a greenhouse gas, so it provides some warming. He's going to, he's, he's put it into perspective as to exactly what that is. And there's no place else you can go out there and get that. And so he's working with uh, his ex, other experts with us. The second half will be on, uh, we have two agronomy experts that will be looking at the effects of nitrogen and, and removal of nitrogen from the agriculture. And it's, it's going to, if they are successful, it will lead, what they're doing with nitrogen will lead to crop failure, famine, and probably millions of deaths. We see, we will not, right now we're feeding the earth and crop crops are breaking records year after year. Well, that's not good, apparently. Uh, we should, again, we should celebrate uh the, the beneficial aspects of modest warming and increased CO2. Yeah, they're trying to use that particular scam to shut down a good percentage of the farmers in the Netherlands, right? Yeah, about a serious thing. Rid of, yeah. It's, it's crazy. crazy. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. It, it, it looks like a land grab by the government to take over these farms. Uh, and they're, now Trudeau in Canada is proposing similar, similar yeah. things up in Canada. Uh, we have to fight this. You know, we cannot let them expand this. If they want to commit economic and agricultural suicide, now, 
I don't want to say, well, just so what, but what we're doing right now here at the CO2 Coalition is providing you and your viewers with the ammunition and the data to fight back against this. That's, that's a really important thing that we provide to, to the public. Uh, yeah. And so you can go to co2coalition.org uh, to learn more, uh, look at our publications. Uh, some of our publications, our white papers, are pretty detailed technical documents, and those are needed, but it's, it's, beyond, it's beyond me to even interpret some of these that they've got. For, for example, so what we're doing with, with Will's new paper on nitrous oxide is I've got another physicist in the Netherlands, Dr. Case DeLang, and he and I will be, actually, we'll be interpreting, interpreting this physics that Will documents, and we'll be putting it into, into a readable summary at the beginning of the paper. Because uh, I've, I've given this to physicists that, that go like that, and their eyes go, wow. And it, it's really, so we'll, we'll be interpreting this, put it in the layman's terms, and say, this is why this is important. Okay. And what they, what they found, what he's found, he tells me that the combination of increasing methane and increasing nitrous oxide may lead to a warming of the atmosphere. Now, I'm glad you're sitting down. It's one-tenth of one degree by 2100. Okay, we can't even measure that, barely yeah. measure it. And so yeah. that's what they're, they want to, they want to create famine and death for one-tenth of one degree. And again, what Tom, what I love to talk about, my, if I go into this in my, my new book a lot, is a strong relationship between the rise and fall of temperature and the rise and fall of civilizations and empires. And we look, looking back through human history, there were three other, we're in a warming trend. Okay, let's start with that. It's been warming for over 300 years. The first 250 years had to be entirely naturally driven before we started adding much CO2 in the mid 20th century in that post-World War II economic boom. Uh, so we've been warming for 300 years and we're in a warming trend. Okay, good. What happened? There were three other warming trends dating back to the first great civilizations. Uh, that was that was known as the as the uh, the Bronze Age, the Minoan Warm Period. The first great civilizations rose up: the Minoans, the Hittites, the Babylonians. These great empires in this really really warm period, life was good, food was bountiful, and then it started getting cold, and that led led to what was called the Late Bronze Age collapse. All of those civilizations and empires collapsed together, and it started getting, and that led to this many, many centuries of the Greek Dark Ages, and it really didn't improve for humanity until it warmed up again during the Roman Warm Period. And again, so we see a strong relationship between these really warm periods and beneficial aspects to humanity and, and, and crop growth. Yeah, I was just reading all sorts of details about how bad life was during the Little Ice Age, where the crops were failing, people were starving, uh, and they were burning alleged witches, were uh, killing witches because they thought that might help. Well, I've got a, yeah, I've got a, I've got a section in my book. Uh, I, I like to talk about. The, do you want? We can talk a little bit about witches because it's fascinating. Sure. Yeah. So it started the medieval warm period was the previous warm period. Life was great. It was called the High Middle Ages. Think Magna Carta, great cathedrals. Uh, again, food was bountiful, and people prospered. And then it started getting cold, uh, starting around the mid-13th century. And it started getting cold. And actually, what started, people th think that it's, it's drought that drives a lot of the, these horrific events. But in this case, it started raining, and it wouldn't stop. So they either couldn't get the crops in the ground, or if they got them into the ground, they, they wouldn't ripen and they rotted in the field and this continued and continued and they could survive maybe one bad year of agriculture but back to back to back years of failed crops uh, meant that uh, as much as a third of the population of the world perished during that time so famine set in and they blamed it on weather causing witches right we got to blame it on something you know the co2 today are the witches of the 14th century. And so they started having, I've got a chart in my book. You'll, you'll find this interesting. It's really, inter 
is I, I compared witches killed per decade versus t cold temperature, cold months, really, really cold. And, and they kept great records of the witches that they killed because it was important, you know, they, you know, I, I, we did good. We killed three witches this week. And so, you know, and so around 1500, it warmed up again and the crops came back and they were, hey, life is good. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a test, Tom. Why did, why did the crops come back and it warm up? Because they killed witches, right? They killed that, all that's the why. witches, right. Very <laughs> good. You, get an, you go to the head of the class, you get an A and a pat on the back. So they said, we did really good. We killed all the witches and life was good. And then for about 40 years, uh, that was good. And then it really started getting cold. And that's when the really big witch hunts occurred. Uh, and again, it was, this chart just documents, you know, as it got colder, they killed more witches because things were worse. They had to blame more people on on, on, degrad on this crop failure. Uh, but again, today, what, what are we demon? They were demonizing these false witches. Today, we're demonizing uh, the false uh, catastrophic warming of, of the miracle molecule. They call it the demon molecule. We call it the miracle molecule CO2. Yeah, so we, we have a lot less uh, less of an excuse to be uh, so ignorant now, right? Back then, they didn't have all the data that we have now. It's just amazing that in 2022, we're still blaming bad weather on people that we don't like. Amazing. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, there was, yeah. there was a consensus. Yes. Yeah. There was a consensus that the witches were the problem. The, the Protestants, uh, the, the, the Catholic Church issued not a papal bull, but a, whatever their, their statement was, the Pope. Uh, issued that that said, yes, witches are real. They cause bad weather. And we, if you find them, you need to kill them. And they did. And so today, the consensus is that uh, the modern demon molecule CO2, and there's a new one that they're demonizing is nitrogen, nitro, nitrous oxide, N2O, not to be confused with NO2. It's not a greenhouse gas. N2O is the nitrogen that's used in fertilizer. And that's the one they're demonizing. And it's going to lead to, I fear, fear, fear for the world, what they're doing in getting, we've got a paper where, that Will Happer is writing right now on nitrogen. Are you following closely what's happening in the Netherlands? I mean, is there going to be violence or are the farmers just going to go uh, start coding and not farm anymore? Yeah, we've got, uh, one of our members is Case DeLang, doctor, he's a physicist. Uh, he and I will be interpreting the physics of this incredibly complicated paper and, and, and presenting that when we publish the paper. So you mentioned the CO2 coalition. I don't know if you're aware that, I think you're the fourth person I've had from the CO2 coalition on this podcast. I've had Richard Linton and Will Happer and just yesterday, uh, VJ Jayaraj. Yeah. And uh, maybe you can help me get some more people because I think it's been really good hearing from all these experts about uh, what's happening. Patrick Moore uh, is a great, uh, yeah, he, I booked him. Great, yep, he's okay, on he's my a list. great communicator. Yep. And one of the problems we have with so many scientists is the communication issue, trying to communicate complicated matters in a way that the general population can understand them. And we're blessed to have, I mean, you, you had Happer and Lenz and some of the two top physicists of our time. Yeah. Uh, you personally have made a lot of media appearances, right? I just watched you uh, a clip of you on the, the Candace Owens show, and I don't know where else you've been. Lots of places. Yeah, she loves me. Okay. Uh, I'm just saying, she does. And she yeah. loves my book. Uh, I was on there. She just promoted my book uh, three weeks ago. She held it up, and she said, this book has changed everything I believe about climate change. She said, if you're watching this, you need to go buy this book. And so I was like, Wow. Right, uh, and then hopefully we'll we'll enroll her, in, and maybe you two get get us get me back on. We're, we've got an education initiative that we're rolling out. Uh, we've got a series of, of books, comic books for children, oh, okay. and associated videos. The books are done manga style, so they're really interesting. The kids love them, so we're presenting science without the alarm. And we're, we're, we've rolled out, we're creating lesson plans. Uh, Dr. Sharon Camp, a PhD in analytic chemistry. She, she uh, taught AP science and 
uh, created curricula for AP science, and she's now preparing lesson plans to go along with these for uh, homeschoolers, could be used for classroom too. Uh, but I think the homeschool community will just love what we've got. Um, this first one was on CO2 and its benefits. The second book is called Simon the Solar Powered Cat. It's about photosynthesis and how the sun powers everything on earth. Uh, a third is on recycling. Uh, they're, they're just marvelous. And then the videos, if you go to right now, or what we don't have, we're creating the website. It'll be ready early in November, but we do have a YouTube channel for our first four videos. And you can find that at CO2 learning center, CO2 learning center on YouTube. And you'll, yeah. It's amazing. We've got a talented Brazilian artist that created uh, the art for both the books and the videos. And uh, I think you'll find it very special. Okay. I'll definitely uh, try to put as many links as I can that are, are related into the show notes so people can look on the YouTube version, et cetera, and uh, find links to what you're talking about. I also wanted to bring up that you have an, uh, an app, right? The inconvenient app that we can get on Google Play, yeah. Android? Yes, yes. Uh, inconvenient facts. It's free. Oh, I, I yeah. rolled it out on the Glenn Beck show a couple of years ago. Glenn loves it. And it went, and we had 15,000 downloads right away. And, uh, and then four days later, Apple removed it from the app store. They okay. said that it was not compelling. It didn't have compelling content <laughs> okay. and, and it didn't use uh, features of the iPhone. Well, I went and looked at all the other climate change uh, apps that are available. These most of them look like failed middle school science fair projects, and they were just horrible. This app, Inconvenient Facts, is state of the art, and we've got all sixty inconvenient facts on the phone. And I link to the charts showing the data. You can link to the source. It's important to know if you're presenting a chart on polar bears or whatever it is, do you, what, what's the source of the data? So you can go back there, find the source. I have an about where you can read about it. And then many of these, I have videos that I created. Um, so this Inconvenient Facts app is, is, is powerful. That way you can have this, this information in the palm of your hand. Tom, that way, if you're at uh, Thanksgiving dinner and your nephew, Billy, uh, says, hey, Uncle Tom, did you know that polar bears are going extinct? And you could go, wait a minute, Billy. And you could pull out your smartphone app. And here's fact number 53. And that's what it is, actually. Okay. Here's a chart of 60 years of polar bear population, Billy. And he goes, well, what's the source? And you go, well, this is, here's the source. And so nice. it's a powerful tool. Uh, so you can roll, uh, roll back and provide the information for the Billies of this world. Yeah, I have it on my phone. I think I've just looked at it for 10 minutes even. It's, I can tell it's just packed with good stuff. And like you said, it's got all sorts of graphs on it. And then you can click from there and get to your YouTube, right? All sorts of YouTube longer explanations of stuff, I think. Yes, yeah. yes. Great. Not yeah. all of them, but, and yeah. the other thing that's powerful, you may not have seen, if you go up to the, into the settings or whatever, there's a thing called MAGIC, M-A-G-I-C-C. -C. It's the model for climate change or whatever. I don't know what the title is, but it's not, okay. it was by created by Noah a number of years ago. And you can, you can figure it, it, what it does is how much warming would be averted if we reduced CO2 emissions in the United, United States and industrial world, you can select 10%, 20%, you can select 100% reduction of CO2 and just see how little warming would be averted. It's incredible. Uh, that we're going to be subjecting the people in the United States to incredibly high energy costs and accelerating energy costs to avert less than one tenth of a degree by 2100. It's it's just stupid. And if you look right now, uh, New England's a, a canary in the coal mine in terms of electricity and natural gas. They're because of wrongheaded, idiotic, boneheaded. I could go on policies. Uh, for example, in New York and New Jersey that prevent pipeline construction, there, there's a vast natural gas reserve in the Appalachian Basin, reserves, plural. Uh, I, did the, I, I was co-author of the first comprehensive peer review paper on the Marcellus Shale. Uh, that's in 
Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, Northern West Virginia. While we were researching that, we looked at the, the top 10 conventional natural gas fields in the world. And those 10, the largest natural gas fields in the world combined, their gas in place did not equal what the Marcellus was. It's an incredible, that's how big it is. And that's just one resource. There's a deeper resource, the Utica shale underneath that, that I think is gonna be bigger. And then I wrote a paper, I'm probably the only geologist out there writing on this other one's called the Burkett shale that no one's ever heard of. And it's a super giant field and it's hardly been developed. We've got all this gas sitting there just waiting to be developed and we can't, they can't develop it really because there's the pipelines are at max capacity. What we should do is ship it to New England where they need it. And they're having to buy LNG from Saudi Arabia and Algeria. And they, they're not allowed to buy inexpensive American gas from Texas and Louisiana. And you say, well, Greg, why is that? That's because of the Jones Act. The Jones Act requires that any commodity shipped from one American port to another American port has to be an American flag vessel. There are no American flagged liquefied natural gas vessels. And so they're prohibited from buying Texas and Louisiana gas. And they have to, uh, they have to buy from our, our, our foreign, foreign countries at an exorbitant price. And so their, their price for natural gas has skyrocketed. Uh, about 60% of their electricity generation is by natural gas. So now their electricity bills, uh, I just saw one, one business that posted his new electricity bill for August after when they went up tripled from the months before. That's painful. It's beyond painful. It's, it's, it could be economically crippling for many businesses. Uh, they're protecting the consumers. And so they're subsidizing the consumer electricity, but the businesses didn't get exempted. Uh, in a sane world, what do you think should happen then? Should we have American flags on some LNG tankers? That's one thing, I guess. Well, number one, get rid of the Jones Act. Get rid of that, it. That's okay. just okay. stupid. Get rid of the Jones Act. Let let us, it's the shipping industry that pumps huge amounts of money into your congressmen and senators. Uh, get rid of the Jones Act. Uh, there's so many things we could do just within a day. The, the, the changes that could be made, accelerate leasing of the Gulf, open up Alaska, the, the National Petroleum Reserve, and last Anwar, the two largest undeveloped oil accumulations of North America have been now been banned by Joe Biden and the Biden administration. Uh, it's just incredible. Uh, these things come, it, the XL pipeline, bringing 830,000 barrels a day of oil down from the tar sands of Canada. All of these are shut down. The heat, it's driving, if you want to know why your gasoline prices are going up, it's Joe Biden. Uh, we're still about a million barrels a day uh, under what we were when he took over. Uh, it, American, America, we, were, we weren't we were just energy self-sufficient. We were energy dominant. That's the word that I like to use. We should, we should strive to be energy dominant. And we can have that. Again, I, I know mainly the, I, I know best natural gas reserves because uh, I worked it uh, for, for the Apple. It, I, in fact, I coined a term, uh, mega giant field, back in 2008. Uh, before there was a term, a giant field is three trillion cubic feet. Uh, a super giant was 30 TCF. I coined a new term, mega giant, anything that was 300 TCF or more. There are only four mega giant fields in the world, three of them in the United States, two of them in the Appalachian Basin. And again, there's a third that's a super giant in the Appalachian Basin. We should develop these reserves. We have generations of natural gas and oil here in the United States. And we have more than that of coal. Uh, we, you know, I, I like coal. We can burn it cleanly. The only, we can, we, with the correct technology, you can create electricity from coal. And the only thing that comes out that stack are, is carbon dioxide, which is not a pollutant, and uh, 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 and water vapor. And in fact, what I'm, what I've got in front of me, when I, when we get off of here, uh, we're, we're working on an amicus brief that'll be filed 
tomorrow. Well, the, the suit itself will be filed tomorrow, uh, and our amicus will be a week later, uh, supporting rolling back the EPA's what's called the endangerment finding, where they found that carbon dioxide was a pollutant. Uh, and so we're, we're providing the science, the facts, and the data that disputes uh, what they what they use to support calling it a pollutant. So we're doing some really important uh, work here at the CO2 Coalition. Uh, the the education initiative to teach children, uh, you know, this important scientific data. Uh, there, there's a lot that, a lot that we're we're doing here. We've, again, we have more than 100 top scientists. Excellent. Um... Who do you like in terms of energy analysis besides you? Like there's somebody on Twitter that goes by Doomberg. I don't know if you know that person or no. is there anyone else's stuff who we should be reading if we want a sane take on what's happening with natural gas or oil? There are a few out there that are really good. Uh, and uh, Alex Epstein is good. Yes. He's a, uh, I have a problem with Alex in that he believes that there's a climate crisis. He just thinks we're going about solving it wrong. So i uh, it frustrates me. There's a series of these guys like Michael Schellenberger, Bjorn Lomberg, yes. yeah. Alex Epstein. They they do good stuff, except they admit that CO2 is a, is a, is a greenhouse gas that's leading to problems. Well, no, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't give an inch on that. Not one inch. Well, I right. can see we huge, huge proponent of the benefits of carbon dioxide. Fantastic. All right. So we're up against your 30 minutes here. Do you want to go ahead and wrap up or? Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later.